Hey, everybody, you are listening to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast, where we will be tackling real financial issues so women can eliminate fear and take charge of their lives. I am your host, Kimberly Davis, and I am the Fiscal Feminist. So let's get to it. Our 26-year-old, she had been saving for an apartment in New York City, which is a very ambitious goal for a 22, 23-year-old. She paid for everything down to the down payment, all the lawyer costs, all the closing costs, every penny she paid for. The pride in that young lady's eyes, it is a gift to parents. When you let your child succeed financially on their own and you're just there cheering them on, that is going to be priceless. And so I would implore parents to really let their kids shine. Allowing someone to flourish and revel in their own accomplishments, their financial accomplishments. What a huge thing for such a young woman to be able to do. I mean, I'm proud of her. I don't even know her. And I just want to say, hey, girl, (laughs) you are awesome. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. Um, This is going to be a real humdinger today. I'm really excited for my guest um, who will be joining me. So my question to everybody out there today is, um, do you think of yourself as a financial grown-up? I mean, do you contemplate whether or not you're actually grown up when it comes to your finances and you've got, you know, your finger on the pulse of where you should be and how you should think about all of these things? Because it is a very complex topic and it sometimes it, it's fearful. And um, I have uh, read on my guest's uh, website that 68% of employees prioritize financial wellness benefits over an extra week of vacation. So this is kind of a really important topic that we're going to address, and it's very multifaceted. So today, I welcome Bobby Rebel, and um, she is a certified uh, financial planner, but she is also the founder of Financial Wellness Strategies, which is a company and a website that you should check out. We will talk more about that. She's also the author of Launching Financial Grownups, Live Your Richest Life by Helping Your Almost Adult Kids Become Everyday Money Smart. She also is the author of How to Be a Financial Grownup, Proven Advice from High Achievers on How to Live Your Dreams and Have Financial Freedom. So, Obviously, she has some secrets, the secret sauce to help us all become financial grownups. And you know, this is something near and dear to my heart. I tell everyone that we have to take control of our own lives. We cannot wait for people to be our financial plan. We have to be our financial plan. No Prince Charming, no Princess Charming. We are the charming. So we are going to dig deep into so many topics today about how to get your grown-up financial act together. Bobby, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. I know you're a money and parenting expert who has been on TV. You've been featured in all sorts of publications. You've been on, you know, uh, you've been in the Wall Street Journal. You've been on CNBC. You've been in uh, New York Magazine, Washington Post. The list goes on and on. So I feel really privileged to have some of your time today. Thank you for joining us and talking to the Fiscal Feminist audience. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for our conversation. So before we get into the weeds, just briefly, I want to uh, understand how you got to be doing what you're doing today, because I know everyone always likes to know, like, okay, how did Bobby get to do this? You know, how, in case I want to do it. So can you oh, tell gosh. us a little bit about your background and how you, how you landed where you're at? Well, I always, well, first of all, thank you again for having me. I always had a curiosity about things and I had wanted to be a journalist. My dad um, was a Wall Street guy and he kind of said to me, well, you know, you're not going to make any money in journalism. You have to go work on Wall Street. And I said, well, I don't want to work on Wall Street. And we compromised and I got an internship at CNN Business News and uh, I liked it. So I ended up going into financial journalism out of college. My first job was at CNBC, and I've done multiple things there since since being a production assistant, but that was my first job. It's technically called a news associate. Um, went through my journalism career um, up to being a television anchor at Thomson Reuters, which is top global business news network, where I also wrote a personal finance column. And I loved my time there. I interviewed CEOs. I did a lot of um, travel, interviewing even Fed governors, things like that. But after a certain point, I realized I was talking about things, but I wasn't really having an impact. You know, you can talk right. very macro about the economy, but I really wanted to do something that, frankly, made a difference. And so I thought about what I could do, and I did what I call a mentor tour, talking to different people that had been helpful to me throughout my life. And 
I came up with the idea to write the book that you mentioned, How to Be a Financial Grown-Up, which speaks to young adults about how to basically be a grown-up, how to live your financial life. You know, what actually happens when you get out of school, whether it's high school or college, what do you do? How do you get your first home? What things do you need to know? People might not know you need renter's insurance. People might not know how does health insurance work and all the things. So it's basically the basics and it features celebrity interviews. So long story short, I was working at Reuters and the book opened up opportunities and I decided to take the leap and I left my job as a business news anchor and decided to try to make an impact speaking to people. Um, First that book and then I later wrote Launching Financial Grownups, which is sort of a companion in that how to be a financial grownup speaks to the young adults directly. And then launching financial grownups really speaks to, I believe, the ultimate stakeholders, which are the parents, grandparents, and anyone of older generations that has a young person in their life about how to get the next generation to be engaged in their own financial destiny, how to get them to step up and take control and be financial grownups. So they're really companions. And now recently... I founded Financial Wellness Strategies less than a year ago. We are a certified women-owned business. I'm very proud of that. And that is really the manifestation of that in that now I can go in to companies, workplaces, and schools to some degree, more companies than schools, but I do both, and speak about those two topics and other related topics like multi-generational conversations about money. And really my most popular um, offering is Financial Wellness for Women, which is great because a lot of companies are doing a wonderful job supporting educating women about their financial, um, maybe I would say how to reach their financial goals and not just sort of muddle through life, how to be more intentional when it comes to their money. Right. And I'm, I think all of that. So you are in the um, financial wellness strategies platform. You are hired by the companies to come in and speak to their mm-hmm. employees on these various topics. So mm-hmm. that it's kind of like a perk in a way to the employee, right? So that they can, they can get your coaching and mentoring mm-hmm. through your talks and your workshops to help them start implementing tangible, you know, act, you know, goals and, act, you know, actions to kind of yeah. clean up their lives a little bit and get with the program. Yeah. Well, and we okay. focus on live. We fo- I f- it's really important that we focus on live because what's happened, especially with COVID, is we've all sort of gotten zoomed out. And what these companies have found, and part of the reason I focus on live engagement, both virtual and in person is because what they found is the engagement on these videos that a lot of amazing companies provide for them. So you might have a 401k provider. Um, right. I don't want to name names, but you, you know, these giant companies that are so good at what they do and they put together these, um, you know, these videos that are generic explaining here's functionally how a 401k works, for example. Well, first of all, the companies have found that people don't actually click on those videos. So that right. in and of itself is a problem. <laughs> There's so the boredom don't even factor, know. right? They're not even, they're busy. They're, they're watching girl math videos on TikTok. What can I say? Right. Um, right. But anyway, so, so engagement's really low to begin with, but then you might know how a 401k works, but you're not going to really be motivated. You're not going to see through the trees why you have to actually do that. And you may not know the nuances. You may not know that, for example, once you sign up for the 401k, and this may sound obvious to your smart audience, but many people don't know this, you have to actually designate investments. And you have to know how to differentiate among those investments. And your HR person is not allowed to give you investing advice. Right. Right. So you have to be really smart about that and self-educate. And then you have to know, for example, that even if you can't afford to put in more than a couple percent to start, you can put in automatic step ups in almost every case where you can add a percentage every time interval that you choose. And those things are really important, too. So what I really focus on, on is getting people excited about their financial future and taking specific action steps. I rotate from long-term goals into quick tip action steps that they can literally do within an hour of leaving the program. And we have a lot of fun. Ignorance is not bliss. As women, burying our heads in the sand when it comes to our money has dire consequences. But yet, so many of us have employed this detrimental strategy. After over two decades of experience, I've discovered that women face a twofold crisis of competence and confidence regarding how they approach and handle finances. It's time to close that gap. I wrote The Fiscal Feminist, a financial wake up call for women, to teach women how to take charge of their money and control their financial destinies. This book will help you achieve financial literacy, establish the right tools and rules for managing your money and relationships, and to plan for your future. It's time to gain and maintain financial wellness on your own terms. 
Head to FiscalFeminist.com to order your copy today. Well, and all of that is important. I mean, look, everybody, you know, when you're like in my business, I'm a financial advisor, you know, this is all common knowledge to me, but like, you know, there are things like Roth 401ks now Mm -hmm. and regular 401ks. Sometimes a Roth 401k is going to be more appropriate for certain people than a regular one, but I don't think anyone in HR really explains that to you. They just give you your options and it's kind of up to you to figure out what you're going to do about it. So the more, you know, as I always say, knowledge is power. Um, So I want to kind of talk about a couple of things today because there's so many different things that you address that are all really, really interesting to me. Um, I'm going to start with with the kids, with the children, Mm -hmm. because one of the pet peeves I have is that there are only three states in this country that have um, financial education as a requirement in high school. That's three Mm -hmm. states out of a lot of states. So I don't understand why this isn't something that everyone is talking about, because if our kids aren't informed and they aren't motivated and excited to understand how money affects their lives, then I think this becomes a problem as we evolve. It, it affects our, you know, our, our our economy. And it just doesn't make for very savvy people as they go through life. And we just keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So I think this is a space that I talk a lot about, and especially when it comes to girls as well, because I think the narrative for talking to girls about money has cha- is not something historically that was done, right? I mean, for many, many years until like, you know, the 20th century, women really didn't own property. They didn't have a vote. They didn't, you know, they, they, they were kind of like chattel. They basically lived in a house. They had children. That was their raison d'etre. And they pretty much were, you know, even if they had money, they had to hand it over to their husband when they got married. So we haven't really established a good way to get our younger girls to like embrace this topic and not feel like it's nerdy or makes them less cool and all of that stuff. But you have this whole thing uh, about these multi-generational conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think in this day and age, like we kind of, a lot of us, myself, I might say, could be included. We might molly coddle our kids a little bit. And I'm not sure that we uh, push them to be as independent as they can be at the right stage. So Tell me a little bit about how you think parents can motivate, empower their teenagers to get involved in this space. And what do you think, do you think it's taking our kids longer to become independent than past generations? Because I feel like my generation, there wasn't a lot of molly coddling going on. Mm -hmm. I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1958. So, you know, I mean we kind of just got on with it because that was what you had to do. So what are your thoughts on this? And what what are your tips for parents who are trying to like get their kids to, to get in this space and get with it? Well, first of all, that was a lot of questions. So I'm going to try to answer all of them. And I do want to just put it out there as a Gen Xer that raising, um, I guess they'd call them Gen Z. Um, I have made every mistake in the book. So the inspiration for my book is my own personal failures, which are well-documented in the book. So (laughs) anyone that reads my book, Launching Financial Grownups, there's my plug, you will hear all about the many mistakes that inspired the book. And that's why I interview experts who are financial therapists and so on. And I am a member, by the way, of the Financial Therapy Association. I think it's really important to um, include the behavioral aspects of how we manage money and the, the decisions that we make, because math does not always rule. Right. A lot of hundred percent. And, I, and, and I, I've interviewed yeah. a couple financial therapists on the podcast. And I have said to people, whether it's in a relationship with a significant other or a husband or a wife, if you're having issues about money, go find a financial therapist, not yeah. a planner, not mm-hmm. a planner. Sometimes yeah. you actually need to understand the why, the motivation. So yes. I'm a hundred percent with you on that one. Right. And, and for example, many parents over coddle their children because they don't want their kids to grow up, which is really normal. I mean, I, my iPhone, Kimberly, my iPhone pushes me these adorable pictures of my now 16 year old when he was a baby. And I want that time back. And it's really hard. So we want to hold on to our kids. And that's why we as parents often over subsidize them. We, there's Mm -hmm. instances, I have a, a very famous money expert. That's my tease in the book that her daughter went to, uh, was very proud that during the pandemic, she got these virtual workout classes from this fancy place at a huge discount. And she was so proud. And she told her mom, mom, I got this discount at this great dinner place. Her mom's first instinct without being asked was to say, 
And she had to hold back, was to say, oh my God, that's amazing. I will pay for them for I'll you. I'll pay for it. Yep. The daughter didn't ask. The daughter didn't need. The mother just wanted to have that connection and have that financial tie. And a lot of things that have, have happened that are systemic are helpful on the surface, but can undermine that. So an example of something that I think personally is very good as the parent of a 24-year-old right now, we have health insurance for our kids till they turn 26. We can keep them on. Right. This is a good thing. I want to be very clear. I like right. this. That said, it is not good for children's independence because it drives no, and it it's on. It's a surprise when they become 26. If it they is. aren't in a place where they can get insurance, like at a it job is. or something. And honestly, right? 26 is pretty old. 26, you are an adult. I mean, yeah. you guys, you know, we can say adulthood should be at 18. We can say it should be at 22. I am telling you, 26, you are an adult. You're, you're, what's that? The plates in your head have fused, whatever it is. Yeah. So <laughs> we are delaying adulthood as a society and a perception because when you extend those financial ties, you are extending their childhood to some degree. And my book is kind of trying to make the argument that we have to learn to let go. We have to be smart about it. And I don't, I always say, don't let, don't create expenses in the name of cutting off kids arbitrarily. So if it's cheaper to have your kid on a family plan and it's going to cost $25 a month on your family plan and a hundred dollars for them to be independent, let them stay on the family plan. And maybe they're going to reimburse you the $25, mm -hmm. assuming it's, it's the money's available to them. But I mean, don't create extra expenses. Don't throw them off your health insurance to prove a point. Don't be silly. It's a family ecosystem. And so mm -hmm. you always want to think of it as a family ecosystem when it comes to money and that you love and support each other, but you also should show them the bills. If right. it's cheaper to wrap them into your auto insurance, which it usually is, show them the bills, maybe have them pay the bills, their portion of the bill, maybe even part of the portion of their bills, because you want them to learn what it costs to live their life. Because otherwise I, they and I did a, upgrade I did their something. lifestyle in a way that isn't sustainable. Yeah. And I think that what you said is a really good idea. Like, I, one of my children, I was, um, as she's kind of build, was building her business, I was helping her with, um, a, like a food delivery thing, you know, like a, a home chef or one of those kinds of things. Cause she, you know, she's just trying to learn how to cook and all that stuff. So what I would do is I would get the, I would have her send me the bill. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't like say, Oh, just put it on my credit card. No. Right. I want you to know how much this costs so that then you're going to take it over and you know what you have to put this into your budget as. So we did that so that she understood, okay, this is what it's costing for this meal plan. I gave her a, a finite amount of time that I was willing to pay for it. Then at this point, you should be this far along on your business. And then this is eventually what you're going to take over. But I thought that the, her actually knowing what it cost, I could have easily said, just put it on my credit card and it'll just automatically debit, you know, every yeah. week when, no, I wasn't going to do that. Cause then she has no idea of how much this costs. So do you think that, um, like, how do we like, as, you know, as parents, we have these we have to wean ourselves off to, of like really wanting to make sure that our kids never feel uncomfortable or feel, you know, like they may be, you know, up against it financially, which I think are kind of good lessons for everyone to go through because it sharpens your skills and makes you understand that maybe you do have to budget and you do have to know how much money you have coming in and how much you have going out. But yeah. what are some strategies that you can share with us that we can like a get over that and then how we can try to teach our kids in the most loving way without them feeling like we're abandoning them, but yeah. saying, Hey, you know, like here are like four things that you teenager should be doing or learning about so that you can become more proactive as you know, with your money. And as you get older, be more in charge. I think it's really important to respect their values and let them lead the way. I know that sounds a little bit backwards, but you mentioned you're a baby boomer. I'm a Gen Xer. We have very different um, priorities very often. Younger people in general, really value experiences. So you might see a young person who's spending what you perceive as, as a disproportional amount of money on experiences, on travel and so on, and maybe less on rent, right? And we might say, oh, you should be saving for a down payment for a house. Oh, you should be doing this, should, should, should. We have to take a step back and let them live their own lives and not impose our values. So for example, you may have an idea that they should go to graduate school or they should do this or that, let it go. Talk to them, say, Maybe this is something you can think about. It's not that you aren't going to guide them, but you can let them know 
you, you're doing this, this is a choice, but remember, if you travel, you may not have money for a down payment for a home. That's your choice, but just be aware of that and let them make their own decisions while giving them the guidance and parameters that you suggest. So for example, here's an example with a little kid. What I used to do with my son here in New York City is when he got out of school, I would say, this is the amount of money we have for after school. We can use it to take a taxi to your next activity, or we can have a snack and eat it while we walk. What would you like to do? So he's learning to make choices with a limited amount of financial resources. And so you just, you know, move that example up higher. But it's also important to know, to think forward that each child's personality is different. So that same child, the older kids responded well to allowance. This kid, I said, you're going to get allowance. I think it was $15 a week. And he already, his part of his family, just being part of the family was taking out the garbage. He took out the garbage, no problem. No allowance involved. I said, if you want your allowance, you have to make your bed and you have to get yourself up for school every day without anyone nudging you and get yourself dressed and out the door on time. And every week that you do that, you'll get your allowance. Well, guess what happened? He decided he didn't really need the allowance. He preferred to not make his bed. (laughs) So you have to know the kid, right? Because they'll call you on it. So it's really important. It's not a one size fits all. You have to really listen to your kid and understand where their levers are, where their priorities are, where their values are. I may have valued him making his own bed. He did not value that. He would rather not make the bed and cut it close for school and come out of the, you know his room disheveled at the last minute and barely make it there versus he didn't really care as much about the money. He wasn't, he, there was nothing he really wanted to buy, right? Yeah, and he, he was, was still going to have a roof over his head and get right. his meals. And, you know, it wasn't like it was, he was going to get thrown out because he didn't pay his rent. Exactly. So, let, so, so let, know what's going to be effective and, and watch them rather than you. Right. So... I, and I'm assuming that within, so as they get older, I would say into teenage years, as long as they understand like the budgeting aspect, then it's up to them to, you're saying they know they have this amount of money. Mm-hmm. So if they want to use it to travel as opposed to saving for a home or, you know, I don't think that people are in such a hurry to get married anymore as during my generation, which I actually applaud and um, I have a lot to say in that space, but I think it's good to take a beat. Um, and so people do have these other priorities, which I think are good to travel mm-hmm. and to, to do yeah. certain things I mean, that and, expand and your horizons, you know? Yeah. And that's what I mean with, with, you know, we need to respect the fact that their priorities are different in many cases. Every person's different. We're generalizing a bit, but I do regret looking back right after I got out of college, I went to work a month later at CNBC and I've worked ever since. And would it have been so terrible, Kimberly, if I took a year off and did something else? unrelated to my career, of course, it would have been fine. And so sometimes we see them sort of having this freedom and we say, oh my goodness, they should get started with their life. What are they doing? Well, you know what? Life is long, hopefully. And it's really important. And we can learn to do different things. We can learn a lot from them. I guess well, and I we, think we're too, in such a hurry. We're in such in a hurry this day all the and time. Age, people don't have the same job like they used to for 30 years. Yeah. I mean, I've, even I've had like you know, several different careers along the way. And I'm happy for them because I develop different skill sets. But I want to ask you a question. So let's just assume maybe you have some parents that are just, you know, not very good at money management Mm -hmm. themselves. And maybe they're, you know, they have a lot of debt or maybe they're just, they just spend money like water and they don't worry about their retirement or they are not providing examples for their children to follow because they themselves are so disorganized on the financial front. How do you, how can kids, how do we help those kids or how do they help their kids if they've made a bunch of mistakes? How do they get their kids to listen to them about how to be financially together? Now they could possibly say, Hey, you don't want to do what I did because look at the mess we're in. But how, how do you recommend that parents like communicate when they themselves have been pretty bad at it? Yeah. Well, I think to your point, transparency is really important. I can't tell you how many people have learned of their parents' hardships financially after the fact. I have a friend who found out as her father was passing that he had been paying her student loans his whole life. She had no idea she had student debt and her father had been crippled by these loans. And she had had the money that she could have paid a lot of it off. And he just never, he was embarrassed and he didn't want her to know. 
And she, you know, and, and it was just horrible to discover that, that he had shared, had this burden his whole life. So, you know, be transparent you with your kids. Think of the stress he was under. I know, exactly. And your kids don't want that for you. So be a little bit transparent. And you know what? It's never too late to be a financial grown up. Get your act together. That's you the know, best thing. Honestly, honestly, Get it together I think- now. Yeah. I mean, well, I always say it's never too late because everyone who listens to this podcast knows I had to like literally reinvent my entire life at 53 years old. And I'm going to be, I'm 64 now. So honestly, I'm still, I'm still doing it. I'm still reinventing and I'm still playing catch up and I'm I'm in it to win it, but it's never too late. Right. And I think that, you know, it's, it's a shame because we as parents, we, I mean, in this guy's case, he probably just did not want to let his daughter know that he was, you know, doing this. And he probably as a parent felt this odd obligation, but transparency is so important. And I think like my kids learned a lot when I went through my divorce because they saw me having to really come up with some creative solutions Mm -hmm. and, you know, to fund our lifestyle. And there was a lot of downsizing going on to keep everybody in schools and then me trying to restart my career. And I know now like, that was, that deeply affected them. They are way more responsible about things than I was at their age, just because they watched me go through some very hard times and they're like, oh, right. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go through that. Um, And so the other thing that I, that is something I also have been really suffering, you know, my decisions have not been clear cut on this particular uh, topic is that, so well, as we get older, we have to worry about our retirement, right? And then, and especially mm-hmm. someone like me who had the gray divorce, I'm I, I'm still trying to rebuild my retirement. Um, but then you have children who have things that they need money for, and they might want you to help them with, whether it's college or it's a wedding or it's housing, whatever it is. And so often, we as parents give them money at our own detriment because it means that we're probably not going to be putting money towards our retirement in some way because that money is going towards helping our kids. So what advice do you have to parents who do things like that, which potentially hurt their long-term financial goals and their life in retirement? Like what, what do you advise them? Yeah, I would advise them to actually look at the numbers and see if I pay for my child's graduate school that they could get loans for otherwise, how does that impact my retirement? Look at the, like actually a, a play financial it out. plan will show and, you that. Yes, and here's the thing. It may be that you are willing to downsize in your retirement because you're it is more important to you to have your child go to graduate school and not have loans. You can make that choice. You know, I I remember one of the best advice I ever got from a guest I interviewed when I was a business news anchor, when I said, but what if people don't have the number they need to retire? She was a retirement specialist. What if they just are not going to have that number? And she said, take a deep breath and just correct course, you know, course correct. She said, course correct. Yeah. So, you know, maybe you're in a house that costs X, move to a house that costs X minus Y. And if you're willing to do that, but don't be delusional. Don't yeah. not make that change. You know, you talked about downsizing. It may be the right choice to pay for your kids and give them the money to get them started and not have that debt cycle. But let them also know, especially when they're young adults, I'm going to give this to you. But if I give it to you, this is how it affects me. So I will move from your childhood home to an apartment so you can get started and have your home. But realize that down the road, I may need your help. And I know you're going to be there for me too, because it's a family ecosystem. Because it may be best, and, and, you know, it may be a great investment to invest in your kid going to medical school. Who's to say? Yeah, and maybe yeah. your retirement's a little less predictable, a little less lush, but maybe your your son who's or daughter who's the doctor or whatever or a lawyer or whatever it may be, or investment banker that you helped put them through graduate school, maybe they're gonna make enough money that they will then help you. Right? Yeah, and I mean and that, parents that's don't again, like that, but still it could happen. It might be the best thing for your family ecosystem, but go into it open eyed. And have transparency and open conversations about this. I mean, the problem is if you don't talk about it, then that's where the problems come up. So it's a quid pro quo, right? So if I'm going to help you now, you might have to help me later. And that might be best for the overall family dynamic. But we need to talk about it, right? As Mm -hmm. parents, we don't Mm -hmm. have to be like super parents and not, uh, you know, show our kids what the ramifications of each decision is going to be on the decision tree, right? So right. if I help you, it probably means I'm going to have less in retirement. 
if mm-hmm. I, so I'm a, a person who's in the sandwich generation, right? So I have children um, and right now my kids are older, so they're pretty much, they're in pretty good shape, but still there are things that come up that I have to participate in financially. Um, but I also have 80 or 90 year old parents, 92 and 94. Um, and you know, they need care. My mom has dementia. Um, my dad's Mm, 94 and he's in good shape, but I mean, we need like care in the house every day. I don't want them to be in a facility, but when I was 40, I never, okay. So back then no one ever really talked about long-term care or long-term care insurance. So we didn't really talk about like when I was 40 and they were 60, hey, if you don't like, if you live to be 100 and you don't know how to take mm-hmm. care of yourself anymore, how are we going to do that? Like we didn't have that discussion. Yeah. Um, and so luckily my parents, um, again, I don't come from a wealthy family, but they saved and they had some money, but we go through that money very quickly because the care per year mm-hmm. is, you know, around $130,000 a year, right? Um, mm-hmm. That's a lot of money. So yeah. I have to do some subsidization from my money. So I have to think about, okay, I've got parents that I've got to worry about and I've got some kid stuff I've got to worry about and I've got my own retirement I've got to worry about. So we have all these conflicting things on our money at certain ages in our lives that maybe we didn't anticipate. And it's a very, I know that you uh, do have a, like a program on multi-generational conversations and I'm assuming this multi, this um, sandwich thing is part of what you talk about. Um, yeah. What guidance do you have on that? Because it's a very, I think it's a relatively new thing because people are living longer and our parents, mm-hmm. some of our parents are living to be quite old um, and they need our help. They do need our help. I think it's important to have the conversations and I do think it's important to have third parties involved because very often the uh, because there's emotions involved and different dynamics among family members that can cloud the financial decisions so i really do recommend having third parties involved and really having open conversations on a regular basis so it's not this one big annual meeting that it's you know when you're having thanksgiving maybe ha- say to everyone look let's have a financial meeting right before we're all getting together let's have you know a little meeting and the oldest generation can check in and say, okay, this is the password for my, I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but it is important. Passwords, really important. Yeah. This is, if something happens to me, this is what, and my family does this. If something happens to me, these are my primary doctors as of now. Oh yes, yeah, so the same as last year. Got it still. Um, this is the password that will get you to all the other passwords. This is the primary person that is going to be executing my estate. And it sounds really morbid and, you know, and it is, but it's also going to help so much going forward. And it just takes the tension out and a lot of the mystery out of it. And then you could go on and live your lives and enjoy whatever, you know, whether it's Thanksgiving or whatever it is without that underlying tension, because the expectations are out there. Everyone knows their role. They might say, this sibling is in charge of this. I want this sibling to take lead on the day-to-day care. This sibling take take the lead on making sure the bills get paid. This sibling take the lead on the overall big picture stuff, whatever it may be. And so everyone knows their role and they're ready to go. And that will take a lot of the tension out, including it's a gift to the kids because then they know and they're yeah. not thinking, oh, is it bad that I'm taking over or should I let that? There's it's, it's all out there. So and, having these conversations before they're needed is everything. Yeah, and yes, get a third party involved. Yeah. And I would say the third party should probably, um, one of the third parties should be a lawyer because I mm-hmm. am power of attorney. I'm an only child, but I'm a power of attorney for my, my parents. And the way it was written was we, you know, they were first power of attorneys for each other, but then once they lost their mental faculties to be able to make these big decisions, right. I mean, they still know kind of some things, but they, they don't remember to pay their taxes or anything. Um, then I take, I've taken charge of that. But when yeah. you're thinking about, you know, and I think I love this idea at Thanksgiving, like I've done all the estate planning. So I have a trust and um, I know which of my daughters is going to be the trustee. And I know which of my daughters is going to be my power of attorney and how I'm going to have my medical power of attorney so that everyone knows who's going to do, be doing that if I a, can't remember my name tomorrow and they need to take charge. But the one thing I haven't done, which you just so astutely reminded me that I need to do is all of my passwords of which, yes. you know, I have a password manager, but unless you know how to get into that password manager, then you're going to be like asking me questions mm-hmm. I might not be able to answer or I could be yeah. dead. I don't know. So 
This is the thing. A little bit of organization goes a long way. And it's also a good learning experience for your kids because then they know how to do that later. But then also they know what to expect as you get older and you may become debilitated because it's very frightening. I know for myself, yeah. like we have a certain amount of money. It is possible my parents could live to be 100. As time goes on, the amount that I have to subsidize increases, okay? This mm -hmm. is coming at a time when I'm trying to fund my own retirement. So I've had a conversation with my kids and said, hey, I can help you guys in certain things, but when it gets to the point where grandma and papa need more of my money, then I'm sorry, but they are going to take priority. And what right. you're all grown, you've all been educated. I'm helping when I can, but at some point I may have to pull the plug completely if I, if they, if I need to put a lot more resources towards them, but we've had that conversation. And so yeah. that's important. It's it's really, and it is so hard because we're tempted to pay for everything for our kids because we still see them as kids and they're forever our children. So these are really hard. And that's why I wrote Launching Financial Grownups because I was struggling with this. And I will tell you, so I'm going to give away one thing from the book is that um, our 26 year old, she was 24 at the time the book was being written. She had been saving for an apartment in New York City, which is a very ambitious goal for a 22, 23 year old. But she for anybody. lived at home <laughs> for anybody. But she, you know, she did switch her major in college, which I talk about in the book, why she switched to being cybersecurity versus being in education. And she it was with a focus on where can I earn more money. And she wanted that. And I will tell you, when she did reach her goal of being able to buy her own apartment. And while um, we had to sort of be in the background, as you say, she paid for everything down to the down payment, all the lawyer costs, all the closing costs, every penny she paid for. The pride in that young lady's eyes, you have never seen, it, it is a gift to parents. When you let your child succeed financially on their own and you're just there cheering them on, that is gonna be priceless. And so I would implore parents to really let their kids shine understand yeah. that many times, as I told you about that financial expert that admitted her temptation was to pay for her daughter's uh, workout classes, right? Yeah. Let them pay for it themselves. Let them come to you. If they're truly in need, be there for them, of course. But they're going to be really excited when they have, through their own money that they earned, been able to achieve a financial goal. And don't take that away from them. Yeah. I think, oh my God, that if you take anything away from this podcast today, Allowing someone to flourish and revel in their own accomplishments, their financial accomplishments. What a huge thing for such a young woman to be able to do. I mean, I'm proud yeah. of her. I don't even know her. And I just want to say, hey, girl, you are <laughs> awesome. And, you know, it's funny because I did, I've talked a lot about financial uh, personalities, money personalities. Yeah. And there's one called the amiable, which I think mm -hmm. I used to definitely be, which was you express your love through money. So you want to give everybody things, even at your own detriment, because, you know, helping people through mon money monetarily is the way that you show your love and affection for them. And, you know, I would say, unless you're like a bazillionaire, and even if you are, it's not good sometimes to, you know, show your love through money when it's preventing the other person to accomplish some really important goals. I, I right. think it's awesome that your your daughter did that because that is the first step in showing financial like you like you you solidifying your financial base. Right. She bought something yes. in New York City, um, in New York which City. even makes but, it more yeah. amazing. Yeah. So I do want to be, but I want to be clear. Okay, so how did she get to that point? It's not that she. So yes, she saved the money. She earned all the money. However, she did graduate from college with no debt. Right. She did live rent free in our home for two years. She did not pay for food. You know, we weren't going to say, we weren't going to be roommates and like kind of label stuff with her yeah, name on yeah. it, you know. So we But she we didn't did waste help the opportunity. In that but sense. she didn't right. waste she didn't, that opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. And she would tell me, she would show me texts from her friends saying, I'm never going to be able to leave my parents' house. I don't know how you did it. And it broke my heart because at one point she did, I did find out that she was turning down some social things with her friends because she really was watching that money. And now she's glad she made those sacrifices, but it did come with a cost. I mean, she did miss things because she was saying, you know, that it just didn't fit her budget. And I so she made deliberate choices. 
Yeah, for two which years. shows maturity. And yeah. you can't have everything, right? You can't go right. on the cool European vacation with your friends and save money for a house. So right. learning that early on. Now, mm -hmm. in the interest of time, because I, you know, you're an expert on so many things, but <sighs> I do want to talk a little bit, um, because obviously this is my wheelhouse. How, uh, you know, I know you talk about financial wellness for women. So just a few tips for women that you would recommend for them to help build their financial resilience and their, yeah. their net worth or how, whatever you want to call it. How, what are your tips to women? Cause we do have a different landscape than men, um, our male counterparts, just given that mm -hmm. many of us take breaks, um, in our career, uh, we still have a gender pay parity problem. There's a gender pay gap. Mm -hmm. There's the motherhood penalty. There's invisible labor. The list goes on and on. So yeah. what, what, what are some pearls that you can share with us that, um, just might, you know, get people to be thinking in the right way? So many things that I have learned over the years from so many incredible experts. I mean, I think, you know, it's very controversial. People say, oh, ask for a raise. You got to ask more. You got to negotiate better. But sometimes the system really is working against you. So first of all, stop playing the blame game because sometimes it is the system and it's incredibly frustrating and we are working to change it and we're making progress. I just choose to believe that even though sometimes the data does not support that. Um, but just understand that, that some things are real and you're not just mm. whining about something that doesn't exist. Acknowledge mm -hmm. it. You know, it doesn't mean we want to accept it passively, but acknowledge that it is hard and that we do have these obstacles and it is frustrating. I think we have a lot of progress that's been made because we can work from home and that helps a lot. Um, but it's also important to focus on what skills you have that will pay the most if money is your priority. Very often we choose careers, and I've done this myself, that are a compromise because they we enjoy them and we want fulfillment and we want to make sure we have time for our friends and family and those other pursuits versus sometimes our male counterparts are just like, show me the money, right? right. My father mm -hmm. used to always say, you work for the money. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. What's the check? That's all that matters. What's the check? Well, I haven't always, truthfully, I haven't always functioned that way. I've written books, books, we've talked about this. Books are not the most lucrative thing, right? So, right. you know, understand that if you are making a choice to go into a lower paying field, that that was your choice and own it. And that's okay, right? But if you want to make the most money, you need to think about what skills do I have? Not that I just enjoy, that people will pay me for. And that's been something I've come to terms with over the years. And it is really hard. You have to think about where am I the most valuable to someone else where they will pay me? Not where I, not what I necessarily want to do. Because if your priority is the money, you have to go, as my dad said, where the money is. And that's really tricky. And that's a lesson I frankly learned from my daughter, um, who, you know, chose not to go into education because while she had great teaching skills and had taught a lot growing up and done swim lessons and all kinds of camp counselor, and she's great with kids, her most valuable skill in terms of what someone would pay her was in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So we have to just say, if we want to earn the most money, we have to go where the most money is. And that's something that took me a long time to learn. And I'm still working on it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's part of why I opened up my B2B business, where I work with companies rather than just, you know, being an individual journalist. Um, there's more money there, frankly, in corporate budgets, right? But also accept that if you don't, follow the money, that is your choice. If you go into a low paying career, go in with eyes wide open and understand that and be exceptional, be accepting of it. That, that was your choice. So right. I, it's a, I don't it's know if that's great it, advice, it, but that's, that's no, I think it's, I think it's spot on and I think it's real. I think it's yeah. real life advice. It's not like, you know, I'm going to just give you some, you know, kind of rose colored view of this thing. I always say to people make intentional career choices. Yeah. And I, I think during COVID, when we had the she session, uh, which was the terminology that was the kind of crafted around the fact that a lot of women came out of the workforce and were let go because they mm -hmm. were in careers that were very vulnerable to this kind of thing that happened, yeah. this, you know, this kind of weird black swan event that occurred. And I, you know, there are different, I've interviewed some financial coaches in my podcast. And I remember one of them saying, you know, there's three different kinds of jobs you can have. One is a job because you need the money and you need to earn the money. The other is um, kind of something that you enjoy doing and you get to earn the money too. And then the third is a calling and you mm -hmm. just, you're just super passionate about it. Yeah. And I think 
as we progress in our lives, the, there are different stages in our lives for each of those types of employment. But especially if you're like starting out, um, and in my case, I was starting out 10 years ago. Luckily, I found something that was a combination of something I really liked and I could make money at. But uh, at the beginning, I wasn't making that much money, but I figured it out. But it's important that you make intentional career choices and then have a really hard talk with yourself. How much money do I need to live the kind of life that I'll be happy at and not be resentful that I don't make enough money. And then you can work backwards. Yeah. But if you are really like, if you're really passionate about something and it's not going to pay your rent, maybe you should just get a job that's in your wheelhouse that will give you the money and you can do a side hustle and work on that until it gets to the point where it can become your passion and still provide you with the lifestyle you want. Right. But I couldn't well, agree and, with and you more. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 the thing with passion is very complicated because we don't, I'm not telling anyone to do a job they're miserable at, but sometimes the money from the job that you're good at will make you happy. And the thing that you're passionate about, people say, follow your passion, the money will follow. Maybe some money will follow, but not enough money, right? I might be some money. Um, like I joke about my books. I mean, I make money on my books, but that's not my biggest income source. And I love my books. It's probably the thing I'm most passionate about, but it's not going to pay my full income of what I need. And so I think it's important for parents, especially to be honest with their children and say, you know, I want you to follow your passion, but I'm not going to be a subsidy your whole life so that yes. you can pursue something. You have to find a way to earn the money. Very often people want to work in a low income job that does social good that's fine. But then you have to live within that income. Another approach, if you want to do social good would be to do something like earn a ton of money and set up a foundation that can pay for those organizations, right? If you go out and you earn a lot of money, you can make a really big difference, probably more than you would just individually working for free or for next to nothing, right? And also realize that a lot of industries do take advantage of young people that are drawn to the glamour and the lifestyle of these of some industries, like publishing used to be or the movie mm. business and stuff. And it sounds very glamorous. And they come in and they work for next to nothing because everybody else wants the same job and they can get these kids to work for very little. But it's very hard to really make a lot of money consistently in those businesses. Some people might make it though. So it puts parents in a tricky position because we never want to tell our children not to follow their dreams. And every single top movie star or top film producer or director had a parent that said, Ooh, yeah, maybe you, maybe you shouldn't maybe you should maybe, do it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you should have a backup plan, you know, maybe you go to medical school on the side, you know, and, and, and some actors, I'm, I, I can't think of who, but I know some actors really have like real, had real careers yeah. um, that were lucrative in something else before they made it as, as actors because they didn't really want to bet fully on it as their only income source early on. So it's, it's really tricky for parents to walk that fine line between not killing their children's dreams and being supportive, but also saying, I'll subsidize you, but here's the exit strategy by age, whatever, I think 26, my book launching financial grownups has an off ramp by age 26. Cause that's when the healthcare yeah. insurance ends yeah. and, and we really should break financial support if we can. I should say dependent financial support. I always support discretionary. If you, yes. for example, are estate planning and you can afford to give your kids money, especially protected in a trust, go for it. Set up those 529s for your grandchildren, pay off student loans, do all the things. I'm talking about subsidizing because they're in a career that just doesn't pay enough and they don't really understand what their life costs. That's what I want to tell parents not to do. Don't be over subsidizing to a point where a child, a young adult doesn't understand their lifestyle costs, what it costs to be them, right? Right. That's very and, different and they're from not, and they're not setting getting up, any younger. You know, something so for a grandchild. Yeah, their costs right. are going to keep getting yeah. higher. And as you get older, like I know, you know, kind of 40 is the new 30 and people live in their parents' basements or so people say. Yeah. But I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, you have to kind of get a grip and understand that life costs money and you need to earn mm -hmm. enough money to be self-sustaining because it's not fair to yeah. everyone in your family that you, you know, that they have to subsidize you. And it also, look, it will help you feel better about yourself. I think when you can control your own universe yeah. financially, you feel like your daughter did when she bought her condo. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. Hey, I can yeah. make my own money decisions without people telling me what to do. Cause I'm actually making my own money. And I want to applaud my dad yep. because 
When I graduated from Georgetown University in 1980, I had a bachelor's in foreign service. And my options were to go work on, at a bank in New York City. I think I got an offer at Chase. Um, the other was I got a buyer. I got an, and I love clothes. I've always loved clothes. Okay. So I got an offer to be a buyer at Saks Fifth Avenue. And then I had gotten into law school. And so I got this job at Saks Fifth Avenue to be a buyer. And I was so excited because, you know, I loved clothes and I was going to be in New York and da, 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 da. The pay, okay, it was 1980, was $13,000 a year. Even then, Oof. that was pretty low. And my dad was like, okay, you're not from New York, so you're going to have to live like with 15 roommates or you can go to law school and then you can go buy as many clothes as you want once you become a lawyer. And I right. was like, okay, I choose that option because I realized that it was going to be such a slog. And I, and you know, another uh, thing about the clothes is when I was living in London and I couldn't really do the lawyer investment banker thing. I created a fashion company because I love clothes. So I went back to the passion again and I was the creative vision and I designed a line of clothes and weirdly it was sold at Saks Fifth Avenue. So we came full circle with that. But what I realized was as much as I loved clothes, the, the creating two collections a year and manufacturing and sending it off, it robbed me of my entire passion for clothes. I stopped reading fashion magazines. I got to the point where I didn't even want to buy clothes. And eventually I just thought, I don't like this business. It's robbed me of something I used to love. Now I actually don't enjoy it at all because it's a business. Um, so yeah. that was a really interesting experience for me because I still love clothes. Now I do actually look at clothes all the time because that's my thing. Um, I, I don't buy them though unless I can afford them. Uh, but the reality is, is that it just stripped me of the whole reason I had the passion because it was just now I was just worrying about making payroll and getting everything sent, bagged and tagged and, you know, produced right. So you have to be real about this stuff. And I think you're shining a really good light on the fact that we need to be, uh, a transparent, not only with each other, but with ourselves. So yeah, th I think that's really an important thing because no one ever talks about that. Like you yeah. seem to be the only one I've talked to that really actually <laughs> is highlighting this, you know, like get yeah. real. Well, and, and you make a good point. I mean, it's like the chef that, you know, is cooking all day and doesn't want to cook for his family or her family because it becomes work. Very often, not only does a passion not pay well, it ruins the passion for you. So sometimes it's better to do what you're most passionate about only for yourself. When you do it for pay, it's a job. When you do it for yourself, it can stay your passion. And there's something really special about that too. And I think that's a good way to have parents presented to a child who has a passion that they want to be their career that maybe shouldn't be. And it's really hard. I mean, there are parents who, look, plenty of untalented people make it in Hollywood. Don't get me wrong. But it's really hard True. for a parent to say to a child, for example, that wants to be a star, that thinks they're a good singer, and they might, by the way, be a good singer, to say, don't do that, go to law school. First of all, they might make it. So you kind of don't want to do that. But it is really hard. But sometimes when you make a living at something, you ruin the passion. I remember... Um, there's a book by um, Terry Trespicio. I believe it's called Don't Follow Your Passion, but the author is Terry Trespicio. And she tells the story of somebody who was a truly very talented singer, like Mariah Carey level, truly, and, and, and had the opportunity to have a real career, had people that were offering her whatever, record deals, whatever it may be. And she, this young lady looked at the lifestyle that goes along with being yeah. a pop star. And she just didn't want that life. She didn't want to be traveling, recording. She didn't want to perform in front of people. She didn't want that lifestyle that would have been required for her to be successful in that business. And she also wanted to keep it as her private passion. She just happened to have a really good singing voice. But just because you have a good singing voice doesn't mean you want to be a recording artist. And I think that's important to help people recognize the difference in themselves. Just because you're a good yeah. chef doesn't mean you should open a catering company, right? Right. No, it's, uh, so, I mean, I've heard people who have done that and they've, and they end up closing it down because it's, yeah, it it's just isn't, yeah, it's a business. And it takes I the think, joy out of it. I think that, you know, um, what all of the stuff that you're recommending will decrease the stress in our lives if we just are truthful with ourselves and our children about options. I think we all are victims now of social media 
and everybody thinking everything's kind of easy and anyone can be a celebrity now. And honestly, um, maybe for some that is true, but we all live in the real world and we have to make real world decisions. And it doesn't mean it has to be like onerous. It can still be wonderful. Um, and money has a way when you have it and you can pay your bills on time and you can do some things that you like um, to make that world for yourself a little bit better, you know, even if it isn't your yeah. absolute passion. So before we close, yeah. um, let's, okay, please tell everyone where they can find you and, um, you know, especially companies that might want to, uh, you know, it is a woman owned business for our women owned companies, <sighs> uh, women that are, you know, the founders and CEOs of their own companies out there listening to this, check out the fin financial wellness strategies, but let us know what's your website. Can they see you on LinkedIn, Instagram? Where, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said it so well. My website for my company is financialwellnessstrategies.com. You can get on my newsletter at bobbyrebell.substack.com. And you can email me, bobby at financialwellnessstrategies.com. Super easy. And I'm okay, on Instagram. I should say bobbyrebell1. Okay. And don't forget to check Sorry, out the books. Um, the two books that um, oh, yes, Bobby wrote. Books. Yeah. Uh, and we'll have links in uh, Launching the- Launching uh, Financial Grownups. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. We'll have links in the show notes for the books too, but tell us the names of the books again, because I think these are really important books to, yes. to read. And I also, I do speak, so, so um, I do speak both through financial wellness strategies and just simply as an author talk. Um, I do speak about the books. I love coming both to companies and to schools, to parent groups for the books. So for parents, launching financial grownups. Um, and then for the younger generation is how to be a financial grown up. And it's really, I love talking about adulting and money. So I'm really happy to come speak to schools and to parent groups about that stuff as well. Okay. So I love the term financial grown up. Um, I Thank think you. that is like, just remember that. And then you'll remember Bobby, because that's a great way to say what we should all be and aspiring to be. Bobby, thank you for your time today and for sharing your expertise and your guidance, because I think a lot of what you said today is very meaningful. And I think a lot of what you said, no one really says, I think people talk more about like, we should have personal finance classes in high school, but really not pulling back the covers and saying, we need to get real with our kids and ourselves about like what it really means mm -hmm. to be a financial grown up and just looking at all our options, clear eyed and not, you know, not taking the, not taking the love and the passion out of it, but just being clear eyed and weighing all the, the different factors. And so for that, I say, not only are you teaching us to be a financial grown ups, but you are a financial guru and we appreciate you very much. So thank oh. you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And I feel like I learned so much from you, Kimberly. So thank you. Oh, you're kind. All right, guys, until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you for listening today to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. Please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast platform. And I would really appreciate if you could also rate and review it. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at The Fiscal Feminist or check out the website, fiscalfeminist.com.